on on one occasion in what he thought was safe company, he is alleged to have said Mrs. Thatcher is so ignorant about the Middle East that she probably thinks that Sinai is the plural of sinus. And I'm afraid this was fed back to Mrs. Thatcher, who was deeply unamused. Don't go out with the boss's child and don't make rude jokes about the leader, especially if one might reasonably surmise that the leader does not possess a notably strong sense of humour. Britain has one of the oldest systems of government in the entire world, but nobody sat down and planned that system. It's composed of numerous bits and pieces cobbled together over hundreds of years as the need arose. I'm John Burko, and for 10 years I was the Speaker of the House of Commons. I've seen our system of government at its best and at its worst, and I'm fascinated by who gets to operate the levers of power and what people do with them. In this series, with the help of Deborah Francis White, I'll be looking at different aspects of our modern democracy, how they began, how they work, and how much influence each of them has. And we'll try to answer the question, where does power really come from? This is Absolute Power. Hello, Her Majesty's Internet. I'm here with the former Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burko. Hello, John. Hi, good afternoon to you, Deborah. This is our podcast, Absolute Power, in which John is going to be my guide through the arcane secrets of our political system. And I have to say, as the news turns, curiouser and f***ing curiouser, John. <laughs> how, how does it work? Do they know? Does anyone know? I, I feel like there's a lot of pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, these are not the droids you're looking for. I think there's a lot of that going on. It's hard to understand how all of this works. Or in fact, I'm going to go further this week, John, and say if it works. I don't know whether it works. The political system is becoming curiouser and curiouser. In fact, it's almost, perhaps not quite, analogous to what was said of the Schleswig-Holstein question, of which it was said that only three people knew the answer. Yep. One went mad, mm. the second died, yes. and the third forgot what the answer to the question was. Oh. However, I suppose the analogy probably falls down in the sense that the argument there was that the matter was so complex that nobody quite knew the answer. I'm not sure that our political system is especially complex, but it is based on, Deborah, a very great many conventions which are, on the whole, increasingly, and I think perilously from the country's point of view, honoured more in the breach than in the observance. Just to give one example, it used to be, and I'm not one of those people who thinks that everything was better in the past, but it used to be the case that if a minister misled the House of Commons, he or she, as a matter of honour, wouldn't wait to be asked he or she would ask the Speaker for permission to come to the House to explain the situation and, yes, to apologise. That happened under governments of both colours. These days, it doesn't. I'm afraid the moral code isn't what it was or should be. I hear that and I see it with my eyes every day, especially when I watch Prime Minister's questions. Um, that used to be your show, didn't it? It used to be your prime time gig. And well, it was, yes. Yeah. I enjoyed it. It, meant, yeah, it wasn't absolutely. for my benefit, but you were I very much, I enjoyed it. You were very much the Jonathan Ross of that gig. Um, <laughs> I'll take sure. that as a compliment, yeah. whether it's so intended or not. Now, on this episode, we're going to be delving into the mysteries of the backbench. I think the backbench might be one of the most commonly used words in political discourse. What... Does it mean? Why is it called the backbench? A backbencher is a member of parliament who does not serve as a minister in the government because if he or she did, that would put that person on the government front bench. Front bench. Nor is it someone who serves on the opposition front bench. A backbench member of parliament is somebody who represents his or her constituency questioning, probing, scrutinising, challenging, as he or she wishes or not, the government of or the they. day, 
if they were any non-binary MPs. If they were non-binary MPs. There, there probably have been some yes. over the years, just not, not, uh, declared. not, not, and not declared. Yes, and continue. pursuing their interests, right. pursuing the subjects that interest them. But they're people who hold no government office and no office under the official opposition. And uh, what that means is that although they're bound in sort of ethical terms by a general code of loyalty to their party, and on the whole will tend to vote with it, some all of the time, others much of the time, and a small number of people from time to time, they're not obliged to do so. They don't have an absolute responsibility to support the government. For example, a minister must support the government. Very occasionally, a minister who's uncomfortable with some aspect of government policy on grounds of conscience, very, very, very occasionally and very, very, very rarely, may be given permission to go on an overseas visit, so to speak, in mm. order to avoid an awkward vote. The difference with a backbencher is that a backbencher can withhold support from the government a backbencher can vote against the government. A backbencher can abstain in a vote on government policy. So, now, so, that backbencher so, so may the... suffer a political consequence, an angry local constituency party, mm. possibly angry local electors, depending what the issue is. On the other hand, the local electors might be very pleased if they agree with the MP's rebellion. And the MP may face the threat of the withdrawal of the whip from the party in Westminster. Mm -hmm. But there is no procedural impropriety about a backbencher voting independently of, for which read, against mm. the government of the day. If a backbencher wants to do that, he or she, they may take a political risk, but they're not doing anything which in parliamentary terms is in any sense improper. What does a good backbencher look like? Good backbenchers take different forms. Bill Cash, who holds views on Europe with which these days I profoundly disagree, has, I think, to be acknowledged as an effective backbencher. He took up the Europe issue 30 years ago and has never let it go and has pursued it with great diligence and commitment. So, you know, he'd yay. be regarded... Yay! He'd be regarded by a lot of people as a good backbencher. If I had to single out a Labour MP at the moment, apart from Chris Bryant, with whom I sometimes agree and sometimes not, but he's an exceptional parliamentarian. If I had to single out a Labour MP at the moment who I think is especially effective as a backbencher, it would be Stella Creasy. Mm. Stella Creasy has taken up the issue of payday loans, loan sharks and the appallingly exploitative behaviour on their part and which damages lives. Parents. She's taken up issues for parents. She's taken up the issue of women in Northern Ireland wanting to come over to England to have abortions mm -hmm. and unable to have them paid for on the National Health Service. And in fact, she tabled and was proposing to move an amendment to the Queen's speech in 2017, an amendment that I selected as Speaker, mm -hmm. which would bring about that right. And when Philip Hammond as Chancellor saw that the numbers in the House, because some Conservative MPs were supporting her, were such that the government would lose the vote he caved in and announced mm. that the government would finance such abortions. Now, that was a very, very, very effective piece of parliamentary political campaigning on Stella's part. So, you know, she's a very good speaker in the chamber, but she's also a very astute parliamentary tactician. So I would describe her to the people of Walthamstow and beyond as an exceptional backbench mm -hmm. parliamentarian. Uh, she works so hard. I get WhatsApps from her at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> saying, and they're clearly not Hey Deb, how are you know? They're clearly yeah. her network. Yeah. Um. You know, can you tweet this first thing in the morning? Can you get behind this? Can you sign this? Can you get on this? Can you make some noise about this? Yeah. She works all the time. Backbenchers on either side of the house have one thing in common, and that is that there is no job description to being an MP. So people do it the way they want to do it. What? That's the first we're hearing of this. This should have been in episode one. This is very there's no job description for being an MP. So people do it the way they want to do it. That's exactly true. I know this what? may sound rather shocking, but it's exactly true. Now, why do I make this point? I suppose I make this point. This Deborah, is a scoop. MP gate. MP we need, gate. We need just what? It's just any job. It's not that it's any job. It's that people do it differently. What if I just wanted to stay in bed, send the audit, email my constituents back, never go into Parliament to to vote on anything? So I could do it like that. I could just phone it in. A member could do that. 
he or she would have to face the voters at the subsequent election. But if you ask me, is there any formal obligation under parliamentary rules to attend a certain amount Mm -hmm. or to vote with a certain frequency or to turn up at committees on a particular number of occasions? The honest answer is no. Now, people might be shocked at that, but one of the things I found as an MP, Deborah, was that now and again, people would write to me complaining that on the day of a debate that interested them, the chamber was virtually empty. Mm. And the gripe would come, which I completely understand, what are all these MPs doing while mm-hmm. they are in their place doing their job? And in defence of MPs, and you'll probably think I am turning up as the trade union rep for members of parliament here, but I think it's a fair defence. What I would say is there are lots of different aspects to being an MP. There's the chamber, Mm -hmm. there's the committee room, public bill committee, Mm -hmm. legislation committee, there's select committees, there's all party groups, there's sitting in one's office and dealing with constituency correspondence or taking phone calls or responding to emails from constituents, there's having meetings in one's constituency, there's sometimes meeting constituents in Westminster, there is any number of different ways in which an MP is discharging duty to constituents. But if I look back, I would say one of the biggest mistakes I made, yes, I got a reputation for being very assiduous and turning up a lot and hollering at the government, the Labour government as it was at the time, on a pretty much daily basis. But one of the mistakes I made was that I became a jack of all trades and a master of none. And I think I didn't have in that respect all that much appreciation from colleagues across the house, because I think quite a lot of people felt this bloke's got an opinion about everything. He's Mm -hmm. constantly jumping up and down. In fact, I think I'm right in saying I was known on the other side of the house as Zebedee. (laughs) I was constantly boing, boing, Mm -hmm. boing, wanting to... If you're a young listener, that was a children's television show and it was a character, like a puppet character that would jump (laughs) up and down, an animated (laughs) character. rather. And other Um, people are known for their expertise. What is making me think is the times that I have gone into the House of Commons, I've often thought oh, this is like Oxford. These people haven't left university. And famously, a lot of people did go to Oxford and Cambridge. And sometimes I think this is like the debating chamber. And, you know, one time something exciting happened, everyone's running down the corridors and walking through and you hear people say, you know, what's for pudding and things like that. And I think this is, this is, a lot of these people feel like they, to me, that they haven't really grown up past university. And The thing at Oxford is exactly this. There's no way to do it. You don't have to go to any lectures. You're meant to go to one tutorial a week. But if you don't show up, really nothing much happens. And I've realised now this is the model. MPs can do what they like. And then right before the election, they're like, oh, my God, it's exams. It's finals. And they have to run around looking good, turning up to their constituents, being visible, looking concerned. And then if they get past that exam, they can relax again. Yes, but I don't think it does work like that. Theoretically, it could because there is no formal obligation to turn up with a particular frequency. But in practice, much more so than in the past, politics is transparent. They work for you. The website keeps track of how often an MP asks questions. How many makes people speeches, know that though? How many people know who their MP is? Well, much probably less what only. Their MP is doing. A, you know, it's probably only a minority that know that. But I think that the minority is growing, and I think that the local media will tend to take an interest in how their MP is doing. So if you're asking me, can I confirm that no member of parliament is ever other than 100% diligent and assiduous, I can't say that. But I would say on the whole, MPs work a lot harder today than they did 50 years ago. Whether they work more effectively, Deborah, I think is another matter. These days, MPs spend an enormous amount of time, and certainly their office staff do, dealing with matters which, strictly speaking, don't fall within the obvious purview of a Member of Parliament. So, Not within their ballywick. Not within their bailiwick, indeed, as you, rightly, as, you right, as you rightly say. So MPs spend a lot of time dealing with things which really should be dealt with by local councillors. But if they're contacted by constituents, mm. you know, it's easier for them just to say, yes, OK, I'll get on to it. Whether MPs are better scrutineers of legislation than in the past, I'm very doubtful about that. I'm not saying they're definitely worse, but I'm not at all convinced that they're better. But I suppose the partial defence I'm trying to mount for my former colleagues, not out of any spirit of loyalty, but out of a sense that it's a fair-minded defence, is that most of them do work long hours. Most Mm -hmm. of them work hard. Most of them are trying 
very, very conscientiously to serve their constituents and their constituencies. So if you're an MP and you're listening, I'm not at all implying that you're not working extremely hard. I am sure nearly all of you are. All I'm interested in is that there are no checks and balances if you're not. That's what no, fasc- that's so absolutely somebody true. could so I'm I'm now saying to myself, it's a more appealing job if I only want to do one term. Yes, I mean it's, <laughs> it's true just... that we now have recall legislation. Mm. So a m- member of parliament can in certain circumstances be recalled by his or her their voters. But I think if I remember rightly from the recall legislation, it's quite narrowly drawn. In other words, that is in circumstances where an improper act has been committed. There has been some corruption or mm-hmm. suspected corruption. It's not just because they're hungover three times It's not just because week and... they're regularly hungover or because they're not working hard or because they've changed their mind about something and electors are annoyed about it. As I say, it's narrowly drawn, and the recall legislation was a matter of some hot debate and controversy, but it was eventually passed. Could it be used to prize out of the House Mm. somebody who was elected at a general election simply because that member's not working hard enough? It could not be. And I'm not saying that it should be capable of being used for that purpose, but it is nevertheless a fact that once an MP is elected, unless that member of parliament commits a criminal offence or mm. goes bankrupt or we can't is imagine guilty any of some very Trump serious Trump. misdemeanour. Listen, that person's basically safe till the next election. Or, the, or till the Sue Gray report comes in. Is it hard to remain a backbencher without being so excellent that you're picked for a higher office or so useless that you lose the support of the party? Do you need to just be pretty competent in and not too good and not too, not too rubbish? Otherwise, you're going to go forward or, or drop off the edge. I think that's broadly true. I think if somebody is unbelievably bad, lethargic, ineffectual, just discombobulated well, some, from Someone got the elected and then they just went to the south of France or something. And you just In those circumstances, a constituency could say you're being sacked. On, there was a Tory MP called John Stradling Thomas, who's long dead, who was regarded as an exceptionally lazy constituency member and was eventually deselected by his party. So that can happen. And there was a Conservative MP in the 80s or 90s who appeared to go abroad for a rather extended period. And then, if memory serves me correctly, he didn't fight the general election. I think he was persuaded not to fight it and a new candidate was selected. So that can happen. If you're pretty good as a parliamentarian, as a backbencher, the chances are that sooner or later you will be offered front bench office and most people who are offered it will take, take it. it they will want it Although what if you're just only... not liked though what if you what if you got a what if your party leader just doesn't like the cut of your jib or doesn't promote very many women or you know that kind of thing and so you could be really good but the wrong kind of good for that person in as much as you're there speaking out for your constituents and oh. they're like they're like, you're making me look bad. Do you see what I mean? Deborah, like, there's no accounting for taste and there's nothing to be done about it. And of course, you don't have a contract with your party leader or your party in any legally enforceable sense. So if the party leader just doesn't approve of you, there's nothing to be done about it. I remember being told at a very early stage in Parliament by a prominent Conservative from previous governments that he had lobbied for me to be appointed to the front bench. And the leader at the time was William Haig. And he, unbeknownst to me, let alone with my approval, had said to William Haig, I think John Burke is very good, you should put him on the front bench. And William Haig had apparently prevaricated somewhat and said to my friend, well, he's quite a capable chap, but when's he going to join the human race? Wow. (laughs) And I got the distinct impression from that that William wasn't very keen on me. Now, At the time that I was told this, I was sort of mildly taken aback, but not greatly bothered. My main feeling, to be honest, was that it came pretty ill from him. It was a case of pots and kettles, because a lot of people thought that William Haig was a capable fellow, but his application to join the human race had, if at all, only just been processed. So it seemed rather strange that he was saying that I was an oddball, which is effectively what Mm. he was saying, because William Haig has many merits, but being 
notably normal is not one of them. I mean, not many people are busily reading Hansard at the age of 14 and making oh party God, conference yes. speeches There's at the age of There's that awful video of him 16. as a teenager so, giving a party conference speech. I mean, it was really so. weird, you know, for Haig to say that I was an oddball, which is effectively what he was saying, really was, mm. as I say, I mean, looking back now, indecently though, hypocritical of him. But back, there was nothing to be done about the situation. In the end, a year later, he did appoint me to the front bench with some reluctance, I think. But we never got on very well. There's nothing to be done about that. I mean, Jonathan Aitken, who eventually became a cabinet minister under John Major, sat for, I think, something like 16, if not 18 years as a backbencher. He was a person of considerable ability. But there were two problems for Jonathan, which I'm sure he won't mind me sharing with you and our listeners. First of all, he had at one time gone out with Carol Thatcher, but he had, I'm afraid, ended that relationship, which did not play very well with Margaret Thatcher. So that's one gripe she had against him. He's the bloke that dumped my daughter. Uh, Don't go out with the boss's daughter. Uh, Child, kid, indeed. And the second factor was that Jonathan Aitken, partly perhaps because of his business interests and so on, and maybe also because of his own personal views, had rather strong views about the Middle East. And in particular, he was notably pro-Arab, pro-Palestinian and rather anti-Israel. And on one occasion, in what he thought was safe company, he is alleged to have said, Mrs. Thatcher is so ignorant about the Middle East that she probably thinks that Sinai is the plural of sinus. And I'm afraid this was fed back to Mrs. Thatcher, who was deeply unamused. And it may well be that for that combination of reasons, Jonathan Aitken was never invited to become a minister under Margaret Thatcher. And he had to wait until the major government before his opportunity arose. So don't go out with the boss's child and don't make rude, brackets, if clever, close brackets, jokes about the leader, especially if one might reasonably surmise that the leader does not possess a notably strong sense of humour. As an activist or as somebody who cares about my community, is there any advantage to my MP being a backbencher or... Can I find a backbencher who cares about the things I do? And even though they're not my MP, can I can I talk to them about those things? I would say the advantage of having a backbencher as your MP is that virtually no subject is off limits for that MP. Now, if the MP wants to say, sorry, I don't agree with you and I don't wish to take up your cause on this issue because I hold a directly opposite view or alternatively wants to say sorry but there's a limited number of things about which I speak in the chamber and that's not one of them it's not my ball it's not my baby it doesn't float my boat there's no or it's rule. too it's too small I'm too busy no, too, too, too small too busy on. there's no rule to stop the MP saying that but in general terms I would say the advantage of having a backbencher as your MP is that your backbench MP has got the time and the opportunity and the freedom to raise anything that you want your MP to raise. The disadvantage of having a minister as your local MP is that the minister can immediately say, sorry, I can't speak on that. Or if you're asking Mm -hmm. your local MP who's a minister to vote against the government, Mm -hmm. your local MP, the minister, will say, sorry, I can't do that. I'm a member of Her Majesty's government and I always vote with the government, but I will air your concerns privately. One advantage, to be fair, of having not a backbencher, but having a minister as your MP, is that sometimes a minister's got greater access to other people Mm. and can exert some private influence. But I think that the advantage to the constituency of having a minister as the MP is very limited. The advantage of having a backbencher who is on tap and available to serve you on whatever subject is very real. I've got some questions here from our listeners. Jonah S. from Facebook, one of our listeners, asks, do you think it's better for a PM to keep a rival in the cabinet where they can see what they're doing or on the backbenchers where they have less power? 
My answer is that, on the whole, it is overwhelmingly better for the Prime Minister to keep a rival in the Cabinet, keep an eye on that person, keep that person under some sort of control, keep that person busy. Mm. Now, and that feeling important. A, and presumably. feeling important, exactly. Mm. It's not an absolute. If that person is just going to be industrially disruptive, disloyal, disingenuous, etc., well, there may come a breaking point. But on the whole, that old adage, hug your enemies close, is good advice. Mm. And I think normally prime ministers have tended to work on that assumption. It's better, to put it bluntly, to have that person on the inside pissing out than on the outside pissing in. The trouble with that person roaming like an mm -hmm. uncaged lion on the back benches is that that uncaged lion could subsequently devour the Prime Minister. That, I'm afraid, really, and there wasn't much she could do about it, was Margaret Thatcher's experience. Michael Heseltine walked out of the Cabinet in 1986 following a row over the Westland Helicopter Company, stayed on the back benches and was building a base and was then in a very strong position. Okay, he didn't become leader, but he was in a strong position to influence opinion against Margaret Thatcher. It would have been better if he'd not walked out, possibly better from his point of view, but actually, although at the time she probably thought he was a pestilential nuisance and was happy to be rid of him, it was against her interests for him to be on the back benches. And I would say that if you take a very clever but notably untrustworthy member of the cabinet, mm. like, for example, Mr Michael Gove. Mm. It's much more in Alexander Boris de Feffel Johnson's interests to have Gove inside the cabinet than causing trouble on the back benches. So Jonah S, if you have, for some reason, a cabinet of your own, uh, that's, John's, <laughs> that's John's advice for how to run it. Jonah, you must... At all costs, protect mm -hmm. your position as Prime Minister. Do not, out of an unseemly spite towards somebody, keep him, her, them out of your cabinet because of dislike. Keep the person extremely busy. Make that person feel incredibly important. And you will be exercising leadership of the utmost wisdom. Excellent. He cannot be in any doubt now. This is from Jan Copy on Twitter, J-A-H-N Copy. Were there, in your time as Speaker, backbenchers that you called on to speak just because you enjoyed their oddity? So were there anyone eccentric or had a funny turn of phrase or you just thought, oh, you know, this guy? Well, Actually, I did enjoy calling those that I would describe as characters. Yes, on both sides of the House. So, for example, on the Conservative side, yes, I admit I enjoyed calling Philip Davis because although he held views which some people found unattractive or even obnoxious... Some people. He, I'm right here. You're right there. He did say what he thought. And I felt that part of the role of the Speaker was not just to call the regular predictable, eminent loyalists on either side of the House who held conventional views about everything, but to call people who would say something a bit different. And Philip Davis did. And similarly, there were people on the Labour backbenches who would now and again say something a bit unexpected or a bit different, or would just say it very well. Another criterion in my mind, I can tell your inquisitor, was if we were short of time, who'd be brief? And one of the reasons why I would call John Redwood on the Tory side was that Redwood was pithy. And on the Labour side, Gisela Stewart tended to ask very succinct questions. So this is the six items or less uh, check out at the supermarket. It's like, oh, he'll be quick. She'll be quick. They'll be quick. And right. as a general rule of thumb, the member who says, Mr. Speaker, I'm very conscious that others wish to speak and therefore I will be brief, will almost certainly not be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> From Johnny Smooth on Twitter, what's the fastest way of rising through the ranks from a backbencher to a frontbencher? Johnny Smooth hasn't got time. He's got he's he needs a microwave lesson. He's on the backbench day one. He's he's got to get to the front bench like a video game as fast as possible. To I score suppose the, highest the number quickest way to do it is to be an assiduous contributor in the chamber 
ready to perform at a moment's notice on any subject, and unfailingly personable to most people, and particularly one's party whips. So That's the way to get advanced be, so be, most quickly. Be busy, be present, be visible, be charming. Yes. Be effective, yes, but I wouldn't say necessarily the quickest way to get promoted is to be the most articulate person in the chamber. I think it's that combination of other things. It's mm -hmm. being generally what is regarded by the whip's office as a sound and solid citizen. And what that tends to mean is doing what they want most of the time. Now, whether that's a recipe for being an effective parliamentarian is another matter, but that wasn't the question. The question to me was, how do I advance mm -hmm. most quickly? And I would say all of the things that you and I, between us, have just identified, being there regularly, contributing when asked, showing a willingness to please, and being loyal. Johnny Smooth, we look forward to seeing you in the Cabinet very soon. From Ed S on Facebook, are there any clandestine groups, like, say, for example, the European Research Group, who might get together because they're in that WhatsApp group, say, let's, mm. let's, let's call this a WhatsApp group, uh, they might say on this WhatsApp group, actually, can we move in this direction? Yes. So are there alliances formed? Yes, I think there are alliances formed, and I think that's become ever more common with the advance of modern technology. So there are formal groupings, such as the campaign group of left-wing Labour MPs and the European Research Group on mm -hmm. the Conservative side. There's a smaller but not insignificant group of very traditional Conservative MPs called the Cornerstone Group, who are basically supporters of family, faith and flag, if mm -hmm. I can put it that way. And there's the One Nation Group of Conservative MPs who tend to be more middle of the road, moderate type Tories. Similarly, there's the Tribune group on the Labour side and so on and so forth. But I think, interestingly, it's not just those. I think there are other groupings. I think there are groupings, for example, of female MPs who tend to cooperate on particular issues or communicate with each other via WhatsApp. And there's the COVID group of Conservative MPs on the Tory side who are very anti-lockdown and resistant to what they regard as excessively nanny state interventions. I'm quite upset that government. women are one group and, and COVID, COVID conspiracy theorists are a second group. I feel like well, women are over half the population. I really I don't feel we no. should be so underrepresented no. in the House of Commons that we're like we're like an interest group or like a crackpot group. Well, I know. I, it's I like, understand oh, that. The anti-maskers and then the other group, what are they called? Women. Yeah, That's no, right. no, I understand. There's no way that they should be in the same category. Well, yeah, as, here we are. And I, look, am I, 100 up to, am I 100% up to date with exactly what groups there are? No. But you ask the question, you know, are the groups of people who communicate with each other? Oh, no, I'm not blaming you, John. I'm blaming the patriarchy. <laughs> And I'm blaming the history of the world. But the patriarchy and the history of the world I mean, it does have include been formidably the... sexist. Yes. And, yeah, I'm, I, I'm not saying you've never participated in patriarchal forces. You were a male speaker of the house. Oh, I, yes. I'm not saying you can wash your hands of patriarchy. I'm just saying <laughs> you're not the whole patriarchy. No. And well, I'm not going to... That is I'm a considerable put... relief to me. <laughs> and my sense of moral worth, which was in danger of plummeting to zilch, has been moderately restored. Um, so finally, John, where would you put the backbench in terms of influence in British politics? Where do backbenchers sit on the scale from basically irrelevant to absolute power? The short answer is it depends on the size of the government's majority. In a situation where the government's got a large majority, which it has at present, the backbencher most of the time doesn't have enormous influence, and I wouldn't put backbenchers above five in terms of influence. But in terms of the position of this prime minister, the power is with them. They have got as near as damn it, 10 out of 10 in terms of power to decree wow. whether Alexander Boris de Feffel remains in post or is summarily ejected from it. Over to them, no place to hide. Cannot prevaricate. Wow. What's your answer? Backbenchers, you have got absolute power. It would be helpful if they were aware of it and if they were perhaps just conceivably prepared to use it. Mm. Well, we, we very much hope so. 
So we'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. You have been listening to Absolute Power with me, Deborah Francis-White. And me, John Burko. Recording facilities were provided by Spiritland and the music was by Hannah Ledwidge. The producers for The Spontaneity Shop were Ned Sedgwick and Tom Zielinski. Absolute Power is part of the ACAST Creator Network and the House of the Guilty Feminist. For more information about this and other episodes, visit absolutepowerpodcast.com. Thank you.